talking about? Mortgage. Damn it. Money pouring out. But I felt a lump. I know cancer when I feel it. Where is she? What is she up to? Never calling, never saying a word. Stress. It is everyone's inferno. Bedeviling our minds. Igniting our nights. Upending our equilibrium. But it hasn't always been so. Once, its purpose was to save us. If you're a normal mammal, what stress is about is three minutes of screaming terror on the savanna, after which it's either over with or over with. But everything changed. What once helped us survive has now become the scourge of our lives. And I just burst into tears and wept and wept. Today, scientific discoveries in the field Got him. and in the lab prove that stress is not a state of mind, but something measurable and dangerous. This is not an abstract concept. It's not something that maybe someday you should do something about. You need to attend to it today. In some of the most unexpected places, scientists are revealing just how lethal stress can be. Chronic stress could do something as unsubtle and grotesque as kill some of your brain cells. The impact of stress can be found deep within us, shrinking our brains, adding fat to our bellies, even unraveling our chromosomes. This is real. This is not just somebody whining. Stress, savior, tyrant, plague. It's portrait revealed. All of us have a personal relationship with stress, but few of us know how it operates within us or understand how the onslaught of the modern world can stress us to the point of death. Few will still know what we can do about it. But over the last three decades, Stanford University neurobiologist Robert Sapolsky has been advancing our understanding of stress, how it impacts our bodies, and how our social standing can make us more or less susceptible. Is the aggregate bad news? And Most of the time, the you can find him teaching and researching in the high-achieving, high-stressed world of brain science. Paper is this huge contrast between classical but that's only part of his story. For a few weeks every year or so, Sapolsky shifts his lab to a place more than 9,000 miles away on the plains of the Masai Mara Reserve in Kenya, East Africa. Robert Sapolsky first came to Africa over 30 years ago on a hunch he suspected he could find out more about human stress and disease by looking at non-humans. And he knew just the non-humans. You live in a place like this, you're a baboon, and you only have to spend about three hours a day getting your calories. And if you only have to work three hours a day, you got nine hours of free time every day to devote to making somebody else just miserable. They're not being stressed by lions chasing them all the time. They're being stressed by each other. They're being stressed by social and psychological tumult invented by their own species. They're a perfect model for westernized stress-related disease. From each baboon blood sample, Robert measured levels of hormones central to the stress response. Well, to make sense of what's happening in your body, you've got these two hormones that are the workhorses of the whole stress response. One of them, we all know, adrenaline, American version, epinephrine. The other is a less known hormone called glucocorticoids. It comes out of the adrenal gland along with adrenaline. And these are the two backbones of the stress response. That stress response and those two hormones are critical to our survival. Because what stress is about is somebody is very intent on eating you or you are very intent on eating somebody and there's an immediate crisis going on. 
When you run for your life, basics are all that matter. Lungs work overtime to pump mammoth quantities of oxygen into the bloodstream. The heart races to pump that oxygen throughout the body so muscles respond instantly. You need your blood pressure up to deliver that energy. You need to turn off anything that's not essential. Growth, reproduction, you know, you're running for your life. This is no time to ovulate. Tissue repair, all that sort of thing. Do it later if there is a later. When the zebra escapes, its stress response shuts down. But human beings can't seem to find their off switch. We turn on the exact same stress response for purely psychological states, thinking about the ozone layer, the taxes coming up, mortality, 30-year mortgages. We turn on the same stress response, and the key difference there is we're not doing it for a real physiological reason, and we're doing it nonstop. By not turning off the stress response when reacting to life's traffic jams, we wallow in a corrosive bath of hormones. Even though it's not life or death, we hyperventilate, our hearts pound, muscles tense. Ironically, after a while, the stress response is more damaging than the stressor itself because the stressor is some psychological nonsense that you're falling for. No zebra on Earth running for its life would understand why fear of speaking in public would cause you to secrete the same hormones that it's doing at that point to save its life. Stress is the body's way of rising to a challenge, whether the challenge is life-threatening, trivial, or fun. You get the right amount of stress, and we call it stimulation. The goal in life isn't to get rid of stress. The goal in life is to have the right type of stress, because when it's the right type, we love it. We jump out of our seats to experience it. We pay good money to get stressed that way. It tends to be a moderate stressor, where you've got a stressor that's transient. It's not for nothing roller coaster rides are not three weeks long. And most of all, what they're about is you relinquish a little bit of control in a setting that overall feels safe. One of Robert's early revelations was identifying the link between stress and hierarchy in baboons. Some baboon troops are over 100 strong. Like us, they have evolved large brains to navigate the complexities of large societies. Survival here requires a kind of baboon political savvy, with the most cunning and aggressive males gaining top rank and all the perks. Females for the choosing, all the food they can eat, and an endless retinue of willing groomers. Every male knows where he stands in society who can torture him, whom he can torture, and who in turn the torturee can torture. If you're a dominant male, you can expect your stress hormones to be low. And if you're submissive, much higher. But there was an even more revealing find. In Sapolsky's sample, low rankers, the have-nots, had increased heart rates and higher blood pressure. This was the first time anyone had linked stress to the deteriorating health of a primate in the wild. Basically, if you're, you know, a stressed, unhealthy baboon in a typical troop, high blood pressure, elevated levels of stress hormones, you have an immune system that doesn't work as well, your reproductive system is more vulnerable to being knocked out of whack, your brain chemistry is one that bears some similarity to what you see in clinically depressed humans, and all that stuff, uh, those are not predictors of a hale and hearty old age. Firstly, it showed that the lower you were in the hierarchy, the higher your risk of heart disease and other diseases. So people second from the top had higher risk than those at the top. People third from the top had higher risk than those second from the top. And it ran all the way from top to bottom. We're dealing with people in stable jobs with no industrial exposures, and yet your position in the hierarchy intimately related to your risk of disease and length of life. When Shively looked at the arteries of a dominant monkey, one with little history of stress, its arteries were clean, 
But a subordinate monkey's arteries told a grim tale. A subordinate artery has lots more atherosclerosis built up inside it than a dominant artery is. Stress and the resulting flood of hormones had increased blood pressure, damaging artery walls, making them repositories for plaque. So now when you feel threatened, your arteries don't expand and your heart muscle doesn't get more blood and that can lead to a heart attack. This is not an abstract concept. It's not something that maybe someday you should do something about. You need to attend to it today because it's affecting the way your body functions. And stress today will affect your health tomorrow and for years to come. Stress affects memory in two ways. Chronic stress can actually change brain circuits so that we lose the capacity to remember things as we need to. Very severe acute stress can have another effect, which is often we refer to as stress makes you stupid, which is making it impossible for you in sh over short periods of time to remember things you know perfectly well. We all know that phenomenon. We all know that one from back when, when we stressed ourselves by not getting any sleep at all. And the next morning at 9 o'clock, we couldn't remember a single thing for that final exam. You take a human and stress them big time, long time, and you're gonna have a hippocampus that pays the price as well. In addition to undermining our health, stress can make us feel plain miserable. Carol Shively set out to find out why. She began not with misery, but with pleasure. Shively suspected that there was a link between stress, pleasure, and where we stand in the social hierarchy. Just like stress, pleasure is linked to the chemistry of the brain. When a neurotransmitter called dopamine is released in the brain, it binds to receptors signaling pleasure. Shively used a PET scanner to examine the brain of a non-stressed primate, our primate CEO. What we see is that the brains of dominant monkeys light up bright with lots of dopamine binding in this area that's so important to reward and feeling pleasure about life. Shively then looked at the subordinate's brain. What we discovered is that the brains of the subordinate monkeys are very, very dull because there's much less receptor binding going on in this area. Why is that? What is it about this? area of the brain. When you have less dopamine, everything around you that you would normally take pleasure in is less pleasurable. So the sun doesn't shine so bright, the grass is not so green, food doesn't taste as good. It's because of the way your brain is functioning that you're doing that and your brain's functioning that way because you're low on the social status hierarchy. The Whitehall study in England found an incredible link between stress, your position in the social hierarchy, and how you put on weight. So it may not be just putting on weight, but also the distribution of that weight. And the distribution of that weight, putting it on round the center, is related to position in the hierarchy, and that in turn may be related to chronic stress pathways. So we said, does that happen in monkeys? Because they organize themselves in a hierarchy too. And it turns out that it does. Uh, subordinate monkeys are more likely to have fat in their abdomen than are dominant monkeys. I think the most amazing observation that I've made in my lab is this idea that stress could actually change the way you deposit fat on your body. To me, that was a bizarre idea that you could actually alter the way fat is distributed. Sapolsky, Shively, and others think stress could be a critical factor in the global obesity epidemic. Even worse, fat brought on by stress is dangerous fat. You know that fat carried on the trunk or actually inside the abdomen is much worse for you than fat carried elsewhere on the body. It behaves differently. It's, it, is, um, it produces different kinds of hormones and chemicals and has different effects on your health. Whatever it is that works for an individual, they 
they need to value stress reduction. I think the problem in our society is that we don't value stress reduction. We, in fact, value the opposite. We admire the person who not only multitasks and does two things at once, but does five things at once. We kind of admire that person. How do they manage that, you know? Well, that's, it's, that's incredibly stressful way to live. One heartbreaking moment in history reveals that stress may, in fact, damage us long before we are even aware. Holland, late 1944. A brutal winter and a merciless army of occupation conspire to starve a nation. It is known as the Dutch Hunger Winter. For those who survive today, these are haunting memories. Dutch researcher Tessa Roseboom had heard many of those tragic memories. She and her team wanted to know if there were any lingering effects. Roseboom knew that our bodies respond to famine in much the same way they respond to other stressors. So she set out to see if the fetuses of women pregnant during these arduous days could possibly be affected by stress. Because of meticulous record keeping by the Dutch, Roseboom was able to identify over 2,400 people who could have been impacted. She and her team analyzed the data from those born during and after the famine and came to a surprising conclusion. I think that you could say that these babies were exposed to stress in fetal life and they're still suffering the consequences of that now, 60 years later. <laughs> Many of the Dutch hunger winter children live today, all in their 60s. Many still bear the scars of war. We found that babies who were conceived during the famine have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, they have more hypercholesterolemia, they are uh, more responsive to stress and they generally are in uh, poorer health than people who were born before the famine or conceived after it. Researchers think that stress hormones in a mother's blood triggered a change in the nervous system of the fetus as it struggled with starvation. This was the fetus's first encounter with stress. Six decades later, the bodies of these Dutch hunger winter children still haven't forgotten. Mothers of young children are a highly stressed group. They're often balancing competing demands like work and child rearing um, and often don't have time to take care of themselves. So if you add on top of that the extra burden of caring for a child with special needs, it can be overwhelming. It can tax the very reserves that sustain people. And if they're stressed, if they report stress, they tend to die earlier. These women have shortened telomeres, decreased activity of this enzyme, and very, very rough number for every year you were taking care of a chronically ill child, you got roughly six years worth of aging. One of the questions in the stress field is, you know, what are the active ingredients that reduce stress and that promote longevity and compassion and, and caring for others may be one of those most important ingredients. So those may be the factors that promote longevity and increase telomerase and keep our cells rejuvenating and regenerating. So perhaps connecting with and helping others can help us to mend ourselves and maybe even live longer, healthier lives.